much, Paul, uh, for that really generous introduction, um, and also for inviting me to speak here today. Uh, I'm thrilled to be back here. As Paul mentions, uh, I first visited the Marine Corps <coughs> Archives it was a decade ago. Uh, I guess it will be 10 years this July. And I was just reminiscing about living in that sorority house and so walking over here every day and taking the German script course with Paul and Lainey. It's a really wonderful memory. And that's also when I began my research uh, in the archives of uh, the Moravian Church. And I just cannot emphasize how incredible these archives are. So as Paul mentioned, I, I have done research in the Jamaican records here uh, that are kept here. Um, the, the material that I'll be covering in the talk today is about the St. Saint, uh, Thomas records, some of which are here, some of which are in Karen Hoots. Um, but I'm just so thankful for the work that uh, Paul, Tom, Lainey, and all the others, uh, I mean, I know you also have many volunteers here who help out with uh, uh, transcriptions and digitization and everything. So uh, everything that you're doing to make these records more accessible is so exciting for me, now that I live in Minnesota, and it's not as easy for me to come here, but for so many others as well. Um, so I really do hope that more people will begin to take uh, advantage of these wonderful archives, because they do offer an unparalleled opportunity to understand it's not just the history of the Moravian Church, um, but at least in the cases of the archives I've looked at, uh, the history of the African diaspora, the history of slavery, and there are so many different archives um, here that, uh, that are, are relevant to other topics as well. Um, but I could probably just wax eloquent about the, the records themselves. Let me get to the actual material of my talk. Um, so I'm going to start with a, a short story before I, I start getting into the analysis. So one afternoon in mid-December 1732, Anna and her brother Abraham, Creole slaves on the island of St. Thomas, saw something unusual. Two white men, both obvious newcomers, walked towards them. They didn't look like normal whites, <coughs> or Blanken, as Europeans were called in the Danish West Indies. They would have been dressed in somber black outfits, and uh, they were holding paper in their hands, and they spoke no Creole. Anna, they must have said, seeking out the sister of an Afro-Caribbean servant they had met in Europe. The newcomers didn't record how long they searched for the elusive Anna. She didn't know it, but they had traveled the globe to teach her the gospel. One can only have wonder at Anna's reaction as she listened to these strangers speak to her in what was probably um, a mix of German, which she probably didn't understand, and Dutch, which she could probably partially understand. According to later accounts, the encounter transcended language. The Savior and his Holy Ghost found their hearts and prepared them, Christian Oldendorf wrote in the 1760s. Through the Lord's assistance, they were able to make their message clear, even if not all the words were immediately understood. Indeed, the two missionaries reported that Anna and her brother Abraham were immediately awakened. They, quote, clapped their hands in joy because before they did not know that the Savior was for them, they thought he belonged to the blanket or white people. So we might dismiss the hyperbolic language of the missionaries, but the encounter becomes more interesting when we consider that the meeting wasn't just about miscommunication. The missionaries were also performers of an act of reading. Upon meeting Anna and her brother, they lifted a piece of paper and articulated the words on the page. And as they read, the missionaries conjured a voice from across the sea. Anna's brother, Anton, spoke to them from Europe. In the letter, Anton described his conversion to Christianity and warned his siblings to make the same change of heart. Now this is eternal life, he wrote, citing John 17.3, that they may know you, the one true God, the only true God. The missionaries, Leonard Dover and David Nichman, I saw <coughs> Dover's right over there, um, were Moravians, a group that needs no introduction in this setting. And they were the first two Moravian missionaries to set foot in the Caribbean. The Moravians themselves were one of the first Protestant denominations after only Quakers and Anglicans to af actively proselytize to enslaved Africans in the Atlantic world. While enslaved people in the Spanish, Portuguese, and French colonies were regularly introduced to Catholicism and baptized, whether willingly or not, Protestant slave owners tended to view conversion as incompatible with slavery. 
As a result, the Moravian mission, like that of the Quakers and Anglicans before it, challenged the culture of slavery in the Americas and forced Europeans on either side of the Atlantic to reconsider the relationship between Protestantism and slavery. Their missions raised fundamental questions whose answers would help to determine both the fate of slavery and the future of Christianity. Could slaves become Christian? Should all Christians become free? And what did freedom really mean? My talk today uh, will focus on the Moravian encounter with slavery. But before I get to this story, um, I want to give you a sense of the larger story that I'm tracing in my research. So uh, the material today is coming from my book, Christian Slavery, uh, which asks three basic questions. First is, what role did religion play in the foundation of slave societies? And I look at that sort of from a legal angle as well as sort of a philosophical, theological angle. The second question is, how did the encounter with Atlantic slavery force Protestants to shift their beliefs about what true Christian practice really was? And the third question is, when and why did enslaved and free blacks choose to partake in Protestant rituals? So most historians who have been interested in the relationship between religion and slavery have often written about uh, the development of anti-slavery thought. Um, but what I found in my research is that missionaries actually often fought hard to accommodate slavery to their Christian principles. And so as a result, one of the arguments that I make in Christian slavery is that they have to be understood not only in, as in the history of anti-slavery thought, but also as part of a long history of pro-slavery thought. Second, one of the major goals of my research in this book is to show the centrality of religion in the history of race. So one thing that I found when I, when I was doing my research is that Protestants in 1650, so in the very early colonial period, uh, they used religious justifications for slavery. So for example, uh, it was often thought to be legitimate to enslave a heathen, but not to enslave a Christian. By 1750, so 100 years later, uh, they had begun to articulate new justifications for slavery, and these were based on race rather than religion. So whiteness rather than Christianity became the most important way to distinguish a free person from an enslaved person. And one of the things that I trace in my book is how it was through these everyday interactions between missionaries, enslaved people, and slave owners how these contributed to the new uh, development of new racial categories and new ideas about religion. <clears throat> so with that background, and I'm happy to sort of discuss any of those points at more length uh, in the Q&A, but now I want to turn back to the specific Moravian encounter with slavery. And what I'm gonna do is to focus on the very first encounter in seven, like 1732, 1733. Um, and before I dive into that, though, I just want to clarify uh, some of the more technical terms. They're not that technical, but for people who don't specialize in all of the different variations of Protestantism, um, I'll be making reference to two different Protestant churches, the Lutheran and the Dutch Reformed. Um, and for the purposes of this talk, uh, the Lutheran church is predominant in Saxony. The Dutch Reform predominated on the island of St. Thomas which was uh, part of the Danish West Indies. Um, and then pietism is a reform movement within the Lutheran church that sought to emphasize the experience of conversion rather than uh, what pietists thought was sort of theological dogma and learning. So you'll see how those would have come to play. Okay, so someone that probably everyone here is familiar with. Um, this is Count Lu Nicholas Ludwig von Sinsendorf, the German nobleman who allowed a group of persecuted Moravian and Bohemian brethren, brethren to settle on his estate in eastern Saxony. Um, and in 1731, Count Sinsendorf traveled with David Nietzschmann, a Moravian carpenter, to Copenhagen to t attend the coronation of the King of Denmark. Um, while in Copenhagen, Nietzschmann happened to meet Anton Ulrich, an Afro-Caribbean servant who had accompanied his master to Copenhagen. So there are no images, uh, at least that I know of, of Anton Ulrich, so I've put instead a letter that uh, 
he wrote. It's actually a, a, a transcription of the letter that he wrote. So Anton Ulrich had been born a slave on St. Thomas, but he was baptized sometime after his arrival in Europe. Soon after his baptism, Ulrich was manumitted or freed. And Ulrich's conversion to Christianity represents a model of slave conversion that embraced both spiritual and earthly salvation. Under this schema, favored slaves could be singled out for attention and education, and manumission often followed baptism. So it may be due to this connection between Christianity and freedom that Ulrich begs the Moravians to bring the gospel to his sister, Anna, who was still enslaved in St. Thomas. Nietzschmann relayed this news to Zinzendorf, who saw the potential for a missionary venture on the small islands. Soon thereafter, Zinzendorf invited Ulrich to visit the Moravian settlement in Herrenhut. Once there, Ulrich repeated his description of St. Thomas and told the brethren about the misery of the slaves and their ignorance of Christianity. Not only did the enslaved have little time for, quote, learning and instruction, but slave owners were openly against it. One of the brothers in the audience was Leonard Dober, who wrote that he couldn't stop thinking about the enslaved. Dober concluded that if he could find another brother to accompany him, he would, quote, give himself as a slave and tell the slaves on St. Thomas what he knew about the Lord. Dober's willingness to become a slave in order to carry the gospel to St. Thomas revealed a conception of slavery that was not based on racial difference. He and Nietzschmann conceived of slavery as a malleable category that could be entered into by choice or by force. Their plan to become slaves, however, was never put into action. When they traveled to Copenhagen and route to the West Indies, they were informed that Europeans would not be taken into slavery. Upon hearing this, the two missionaries decided to pursue work, work as skilled craftsmen in order to support themselves while evangelizing to slaves. The thought that Moravian missionaries would become slaves perplexed the Moravian historian Christian Oldendorf. Writing 30 years after Ulrich's visit, Oldendorf commented, the thought that they would have to become slaves was terrifying, but also false and unnecessary. It was well known that no whites could be made or taken as slaves, and even if you wanted to become one, it wouldn't be allowed. Oldendorf's horrified reaction to the idea that white Christian missionaries could be slaves is an indication of how the conception of race and slavery would change within the Moravian church. Oldendorf's own experiences in the Danish West Indies in the 1760s gave him a thoroughly racial understanding of slavery. His disbelief that, what, disbelief that whites could be slaves was a consequence of the Moravian involvement in Caribbean slave society. In 1731, however, neither Nichmann nor Dober, nor Zinzendorf, had seen a Caribbean slave society firsthand, and their only window into that world was Anton Ulrich. So when, and this is just the, so you know where St. Thomas is approximately in the Caribbean, when Dober and Nichman arrived on St. Thomas in 1732, they met a small number of free black Christians and enslaved converts who had followed a path similar to that of Ulrich. Often favored by their masters, they were able to re receive some education, which led to baptism and sometimes freedom. While the missionaries showed interest in these individuals, they questioned whether they were true Christians. A few weeks after their arrival, for example, they visited someone who they identified as, quote, a Moor who had lived in Berlin for 18 years. They noted that he, quote, immediately began to speak to us out of the Bible and that he had a lot of knowledge, but they concluded that he was completely drowned in the lust of, lusts of the flesh. A few days later, Dober and Nichman met another educated black man who they described as a well-known Moor. Again, Dober and Nichman criticized this black Christian and told him, Quote, he had, had to give more of an effort than just learning everything by heart. In an interesting comparison, they added, the black Christians place as much importance on learning as the Lutherans do on going to church and communion. By connecting the black Christian interest in learning to the Lutheran emphasis on church and communion, Dober and Nichman applied a pietist critique of religion to the state of Christianity, Christianity among blacks in St. Thomas. They implied that the desire to learn placed too much focus on form and too little on heart. More important, however, is the fact that the missionaries did not connect Christianity to manumission. 
While many of the black Christians earned their freedom after receiving Christian education and baptism, Dobrin Nichman defined true slavery as spiritual. For the missionaries, freedom meant conversion, not manumission, a position that was most likely resented by blacks who either hoped to or had earned their freedom after conversion. Instead of promising manumission, Dobre Nichman emphasized the danger of inner slavery to the, uh, to the converts who showed an interest in them. When Anton Ulrich's sister, Anna, visited them on January 17th, for example, she, quote, complains that the overseer treated her too harshly. The missionaries refused to comfort her or take any action on her part, telling her instead that, quote, this could be a great opportunity to truly call on God so that she could be freed from her inner slavery, since her outward slavery was of little consequence. The missionaries' definition of true freedom had both behavioral and spiritual elements. Aside from experiencing a new, new birth, truly free Christians were expected to maintain monogamous marriages and refrain from bodily sins. They condemned the common practice of taking multiple partners or having more than one wife, a position that was seen by both blacks and whites on St. Thomas as unreasonable. Non-monogamous family structures were common and accepted among most of the enslaved Africans while white masters often took advantage of their power to initiate or coerce their enslaved people into sexual relationships, meaning that lifelong monogamy was largely a foreign concept on the island. <clears throat> In a series of conversations with a free black man named Alexander, for example, the missionaries tried to convince him that he should take only one wife. Not sure if I have this. Uh, reading from Reading from Paul, they class polygamy with prostitution and warned him to stay true to one woman. Alexander, clearly incredulous, explains that, quote, all the citizens and masters who are called Christians engage in such behavior. The missionaries insisted that these men did not belong to Christ, but to the devil. Dober and Nichman's standards graded on Alexander. After several months of regular meetings, Alexander lost his temper with the missionaries, called them papists, and told them that nobody can live up to their expectations. While their rigid theology and fixed standards of morality sometimes undermines their appeal to the enslaved, it's also important to recognize what the missionaries had to offer their first converts. First of all, enslaved people were eager to gain access to the written word. In a place where literacy and books were carefully guarded by the master class, the missionaries introduced their pupils to scriptural texts and taught them how to read. For people of African descent, books were not just sources of religious inspiration, they were also physical objects that had spiritual and economic power. In a very practical sense, it's through text inscribed paper that Afro-Caribbeans could prove their freedom or their status as Christians. But many Afro-Caribbeans also view, view the act of reading and the possession of material texts as a source of power and influence. A typical Moravian reading included the recitation of scripture as well as lessons in literacy. By organizing their meetings this way, the missionaries reinforced their status as readers who had power to, quote, make paper speak, as some Afro-Caribbeans called it. In one meeting, for example, the missionaries read Christ's Sermon on the Mount, in which Jesus advocates turning the other cheek. This reading led into a discussion of how one could accept being hit. <coughs> Emmanuel, an enslaved Creole man, objected to this interpretation and argued that he would never turn the other cheek because, quote, it would cost him his honor if he didn't defend himself. When the missionaries explained to him that the Lord wanted it that way, Emmanuel responded with a compromise. He decided that he would ask God to spare him from the possibility of getting in a fight. Instead, he would prefer to stay home and learn. Emmanuel's interactions with the missionaries provide insight into the negotiation over Christian practice, the significance of literacy, and the construction of enslaved Christian masculinity. Emmanuel was not willing to accept the idea that turning the other cheek meant submitting to abuse without complaints. Instead, he reinterpreted the passage to accommodate both his sense of honor and his desire to bolster his education. Importantly, his preference to stay home and learn suggested the existence of an alternate source of male honor. By becoming a learned man who could read, Emmanuel could, Emmanuel could, uh, 
create a literacy-based Christian identity that imbued him with a different type of power. Emmanuel's approach gained him both respect and status within the Moravian congregation. <coughs> Just 14 days after the discussion of the Sermon on the Mount, he was one of the first three individuals baptized in St. Thomas. Emmanuel, who was baptized Andreas, went on to become a leading male elder on the island, and he later traveled here to Pennsylvania and then to Europe, where he died in 1744. In 1747, he was commemorated in Johann Valentin Haidt's painting, The First Fruits, um, which is what this detail is from, and we'll come back to that painting later. Apart from the promise of literacy, the Moravian missionaries could also be seen as potential social advocates. While they often refused to defend uh, slaves against the wrath of their masters, they did provide support for enslaved people in relationships with other enslaved people. So at one point, for example, Anna complains that her husband was holding, quote, heathen dances in her home, and that this was a great burden for her. While both Do Dover and, um, while Dover interpreted Anna's call for help as a sign of her conversion, her intentions were likely much more complex than they realized. By persuading the missionaries to lobby on her behalf, she gained influence over her husband and also convinced the missionaries of her religious sincerity. Finally, the missionaries were unique in their treatment of the enslaved as spiritual equals, and they provided an alternate religious, uh, religious community unlike any other available on the islands. Over time, the Moravians also adapted their theology to better accommodate the pressures of enslaved life. In the 1730s and 40s, for example, the meaning of marriage was a central topic of debate. While missionaries insisted that marriage should be mon a monogamous relationship between one man and one woman, enslaved converts had their own ideas and they used their reading skills to consult the Bible and challenge the missionaries' interpretation of scripture. During one conference, some black Christians, quote, searched in the Old Testament, pointing out parts that seemed to justify their polygamous practices. Despite, they could have been looking at a number of different passages. Um, and, but despite the missionaries' resentment of these challenges, they did eventually change their policy on marriage. In 1749, during another set of conferences, the brethren concluded that men with more than, wife, more than one wife would be allowed to join the congregation but they forbid converts from taking any more classes <coughs> after their baptism. And they also, interestingly, forbid men from, with two wives from divorcing either wife after their baptism. As these changes reveal, the missionaries became increasingly flexible in their dealings with polygamy. And their policy shifts represent uh, one important adaptation to Caribbean slavery. Influenced by their conversations with black congregants and their recognition that slave owners could separate families at will, the missionaries redefined marriage to accommodate slavery. When Dober and Nichman returned to Germany, they brought with them both bodily and spiritual convictions that helped to shape the aims and policies of future Moravian missions. When Nichman arrived in Europe after six, just 16 weeks in St. Thomas, he revealed a surprising and I think important commitment to the institution of slavery that was very much the product of his experience on St. Thomas. So in Copenhagen, Nietzschmann met with Princess Hedwig and Senior Chamberlain von Plessen, who told him that they would grant freedom to any slaves who converted, a gesture that they considered to be both moral and efficacious. Probably to their surprise, Nichman replied, such an idea would make them hypocrites. The apostle said, whoever was called to be a servant should not seek to be rid of his place, but rather remain a menial laborer and serve his master according to his desires. Nichman's insistence that slaves should not be manumitted after baptism was another important theological adaptation to Caribbean slavery. Noting that the enslaved, quote, had the ability to take on the appearance of being Christian quite easily without any true transformation of the heart, Nichman revealed both his commitment to pietist reform and his fear that enslaved people could use religious opportunity to free themselves from bondage. Thus, after just four months in St. Thomas, Nichman had come to the conclusion that Christianity needed to be divorced from freedom 
in order to prevent both opportunistic conversions and planter wrath. Many scholars have assumed that this kind of argument would have come from planters, or that it came later in the history of Christian missions. But Nichman's report uh, suggests that it could be an almost immediate adjustment to slavery developed by um, the earliest missionaries. It's also interesting to note that it was the Europeans who've never, um, that often it's more likely that a European who's never lived in a slave society is going to support the stance that uh, conversion should bring with it uh, freedom. <clears throat> so aside from this theological commitment to slavery, Nijman arrived in Copenhagen uh, also with a young enslaved boy named Jupiter, while Do uh, Dover brought back Oli Carmel. While Jupiter lived longer in Europe, it was the young Carmel who made the greater impression on the Moravian records. After arriving in Herrenhut in February 1735, Dover reported with pride that, quote, the young Moor had traveled 1,400 miles from Guinea to St. Thomas and 1,500 from there to Herrenhut. Indeed, Carmel, who they identified as Luango, had been born in Africa, but had lost both his parents during a war before being captured, sold into slavery, and taken to the Danish West Indies. In St. Thomas, Carmel was purchased by the Moravians, and the small boy was brought back to Europe with Dover. In Herrenhut, Carmel quickly became beloved and was seen as a sign of grace. Sinsendorf wrote that the young boy had a, quote, burning love for the Savior, even though he knows very little German. Despite the objections of some who considered Carmel to be too young and uneducated, the brethren concluded that he should be baptized as soon as possible. On August 22nd, 1735, just over four years after David Nietzschmann's chance meeting with Anton Ulrich, the seven-year-old uh, Carmel was baptized in Eversdorf. Carmel, who was baptized Joshua, died the following March at the age of eight. Yet despite, or perhaps in part because of, the shortness of his life, Carmel became a poignant symbol of Moravian missionary pride. Carmel could be forever remembered as the first fruit, the embodiment of the Moravian's global reach. The Moravian historian Christian Oldendorf viewed Carmel's baptism as a prelude to the work they, could, they would do to carry the gospel to all the heathen, and Carmel himself was in, immortalized in the first fruits painting, completed in 1747. And he was also immortalized in the first Moravian plantation in Jamaica, which was named after the young boy. So you can see um, Carmel, Oli Carmel and Jupiter are, are the two boys right in the center. Of this, of this painting. Carmel's revered place in Moravian history contrasts with that of Anton Ulrich, the man who instigated the mission. Unlike Carmel, who died before he could question Moravian theology, Anton Ulrich's relationship with the Moravians was more complicated. In 1734, after Dober had been in St. Thomas for two years, Ulrich returns to the island of his birth. He was a free man, and he set to work as an overseer before purchasing a small plantation and a slave of his own. <clears throat> Yet once in St. Thomas, he drifted from the brethren. Dober considered Ulrich to be, quote, too weak in order to stand up to the violence of his sins and stay true to what he knew. Well, this is clearly a one-sided opinion and we don't have Ulrich's perspective. Uh, what is clear is that Anton Ulrich decided to pursue his own path in St. Thomas as a small-time landowner and slave owner and that the Moravian brethren uh, were no longer compatible with his convictions or aspirations. <clears throat> the missionary's difficulty in sustaining their relationship with Ulrich was an early indicator of some of the problems that they would have attracting educated black Christians into their fold. For, for Ulrich, like many other black Christians in St. Thomas, being a Christian was very much connected to rising social status and freedom. From Ulrich's point of view, the Moravians had initially provided an opportunity um, for travel, companionship, and many other things, likely. And he hopes that they would aid the members of his family who were still held in Caribbean slavery. But the Moravians' condemnations of, of most Christians as unawakened and their embrace of earthly slavery created a wedge between the missionaries and the men who inspired their mission. So I want to conclude um, 
by connecting this story that I've told today back to my larger project. So first of all, as I've shown, um, it was often Protestant missionaries rather than slave owners who had this incentive to argue for the legitimacy of what I call Christian slavery. Quaker and Anglican missionaries like the Moravians reacted to African slavery by seeking to integrate slaveholding into an evangelical Christian vision. Not all of their reactions were the same, but they all emphasized the importance of slave conversion and urged slave owners to reform their worldviews and their practices. Now in, in the larger book, probably the, the most surprising aspect of the argument comes with Quakers, who are most often associated only with abolitionism. Um, but my research into 17th century Quakerism uh, tells a different story. Uh, and many Quakers were slave owners and they tried to integrate uh, that practice into, um, into Quakerism. So second of all, the Moravian missions to slaves were intimately connected to the development of racial categories. So in my talk today, I showed how Moravian involvement with slavery resulted in a change in the way that um, many Moravians understood race. And in the larger project, I look more closely at the, the actual development of racial categories in the Caribbean. So in Barbados, for example, I found that while Europeans referred to themselves in, as Christians in 1650, right, 50 to 100 years later, they had begun replacing the, the term Christian with the word white. Um, and so in other words, the concept of race, and especially sort of the idea that there even are white people, right, the, the, the concept of whiteness, uh, was a historical invention that was created as a new way to justify slavery, and, and it was also used to promote slave conversion. Right? Because you can see the argument here that missionaries have to make. If people think that all Christians are free and slave owners don't, allow, don't, want, to, don't want to free their slaves, then the only way that you can promote slave conversion is by coming up with a new justification that will, that will allow enslaved people to become Christians with, not, without becoming free. So finally, I want to go back to this pic, uh, painting of the first fruits. So as this painting shows, the Moravians perceived themselves and projected themselves as a global church. Um, you know, we have the conversion of Africans, Native Americans, Greenlanders, Persians. Um, this was in, uh, integral to sort of the emerging Moravian identity. And Moravian missionaries traveled the world to illustrate the universality of the Christian gospel. Uh, so this painting tells us a lot, but we also have to remember who's not included. So I mentioned before that Carmel and Jupiter in the center, um, just under Jesus, behind them is Emmanuel or Andreas, the enslaved man who embraced literacy as a form of honor. Um, around them are other converts from all over the world. But of course, Anton Ulrich is nowhere to be seen. Um, and despite the fact that he inspired the mission, Ulrich was not memorialized in any Moravian paintings because he not only drifted, but actively criticized the brethren in their approach to slave conversion. Carmel, by contrast, whose short life did not provide an opportunity to question the missionary enterprise, was an easier figure to idealize. So as this painting suggests, while the Moravians projected an image of themselves as a global church, the reality was much more complicated. And the reality is that missionaries both fought against the culture of slavery, while also reinforcing it. Black Moravians, however, had a different perspective. And I want to leave you with what I think is one of the most incredible documents uh, I've found in the Moravian archives. I think this one is from the Harrington archive. And this is a letter um, that was dictated by a free black Moravian woman named Marata, um, who wrote to the Queen of Denmark to support black Christians, to ask her to support black Christians. There's a printed version of this, but this is a, a draft version that I found that I really like. So she was writing in 1739, a few years after Dobra and Nijman had left the islands. And in the intervening years, the slave owners had reacted violently to the Moravian presence. Black converts were beaten and attacked by white colonists. Slave owners stole Bibles from enslaved Christians, and they burned Moravian books. In her letter, Murata asks the queen to support the black women of St. Thomas because the slave owners would not allow them to serve the Lord Jesus. 
The petition was accompanied by another letter written in Dutch Creole and also signed by several other black Moravians on St. Thomas. This letter went into more detail about the problems facing enslaved Christians. The white planters, quote, beat and injure us when we learn about the savior they wrote. They burn our books, call our baptism the baptism of dogs, and call the brethren beasts. When we put this letter by, side by side with the Moravian diaries, it reminds us that if we really want to understand the Moravian encounter, we need to understand it from multiple angles and multiple perspectives. I think we can acknowledge the sacrifice and dedication of the European missionaries, many of whom lost their lives in the Caribbean, and two of whom were willing to enslave themselves in order to carry the gospel to other slaves. Um, I think we can do that at the same time as, as, as we acknowledge that many of those missionaries also ended up defending slavery as an institution, at the same time as they were criticizing white slave owners for their brutality. Right? It's not a simple story. We also, I think, need to shift our perspective increasingly to think about the actual experiences of the black Moravians who chose to convert. For people like Anton Ulrich, the Moravian church offered an opportunity but it was eventually a disappointment. But for people like Maratha, Moravian theology provided a powerful reservoir of knowledge that gave her the platform to protest mistreatments. So I think that as we reckon with the Moravian encounter with slavery, our histories need to keep all of these strands together in balance and not allow one story to obscure the others. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your talk, and um, I wanted to ask about your sources a little bit more. You put a lot of them up, so we see a lot of diaries and letters. Um, what other kinds of sources in the archives here and elsewhere did you use that were helpful? And also, as you point out, the importance of listening to different voices and the lack of voices coming from the black enslaved or freed slaves. Um, where you can find more voices like Murata, perhaps, because you often point out, well, this is a one-sided perspective, we're hearing this. How do we start to try to fill that gap so that we are <coughs> enriching all the different strands rather than one is very weak because we don't have as many voices? Thank you, that's a really wonderful and important question, and it lets me talk about what I, I hope I put a few things back here. Let's see, okay, ah, all right. Else did I put? Okay, this is, so in terms of the sources, and I'll just sort of answer that very, um, I, so yes, the diaries I used, the letters I used, um, these are the, like, this is the registers, the, the, um, the church registers where they would put down the names of um, everyone who was baptized. Now this is, um, right, because what you said is absolutely correct, so that we have plenty of, uh, plenty of material to talk about the, the, the white male missionaries, right? There, there's actually not as much to talk about the, the women who are uh, often there, um, although there are more materials than there are about the, many of the enslaved people. But so in, in the absence of those materials, one of the things that I've, that I've done in my research is to use these church registers in order to um, get more information about the demographics of the enslaved Moravian con uh, congregation. And in many cases, you can, the, the, the missionaries recorded not only someone's name, um, where they were born, but sometimes you also will hear uh, who their parents, where their parents came from in Africa. And so you can actually, you can put together uh, different ethnic backgrounds, you can see, you know, people, someone who's from, you know, Popo and someone who's Akan, you know, getting married and having a child, and a Creole child, so you can get a sense of the different ways in which communities are being recreated. So that is one way that um, I have tried to use these records to get into, get into those different, those different questions. Um, Oldendorp, the, you know, Christian Oldendorp, who I refer to many times, I mean, his records are still extremely helpful. So he was, uh, I think he was in St. Thomas in the 1750s, right? And he published, or he came back and he wrote these he, thousands of pages uh, about the history of the mission, but also he was doing ethnographic research. And he interviewed many, many um, enslaved uh, converts who were living in St. Thomas at the time. And so 
frankly, the research on Oldendorf has only just begun. I mean, I really do think that if these records were not in German script, that we would have hundreds and hundreds of books already written on them, um, because really, like, there's because there has a, this is a problem in the English sources as well. Uh, there are so many scholars who have developed really great methodological approaches to trying to sort of you know, uh, access what you know, what people call the silences in the archive, right? Like reading against the grain, along the bias grain, etc. Um, and so you know, like, I keep thinking whenever I talk to these people who only use Anglophone sources, oh, if if only you know you even like dip you could dip your toe into some of this material because it really does. I mean, these are, this, is, this is one method, but there are these letters written by um, enslaved and free people of color. So this is a, um, a letter written you know, in the hands of I think a, a free, uh, free black man living in St. Thomas in the um, 1730s. And what was the other one I put up here? Oh, this is just the, this is the letter from Leonard Dober. Um, but in any case, there are, there's a lot to do. I mean, I wish people, I wish more people would, would use their records and take the German script course, because that really, that is a big barrier. <laughs> but thank you. Uh, Craig, yes. Uh, I was intrigued by the, um, the justification for slavery that comes so early uh, that, you know, they're claiming this is biblical and yet the polygamy thing, which is being quoted from, uh, do you perceive it, is it the fact that the uh, Paul is in the New Testament gives it greater authority for the Moravians that you, know, you do have the most clear justification for enslaved Christians in that, as opposed to Old Testament polygamy? You know, I've never really thought through it in those terms, but I think that that, that makes sense to me. Um, but I, yeah, I don't know. And I never saw anybody sort of, any of the, the missionaries justified in particularly those ways. But yeah, I mean, when I think about it, the way that Oldendorf sort of, you know, it's like, I keep think, saying, re re referencing these things from the Old Testament. It's so annoying. <laughs> um, you do kind of get this, uh, now that you say that, it does, it does sort of, um, it, it fits with what I have seen in the record so far. Yeah, thank you. Yes? I'm interested in, in hearing more about the, the hostility of the white colonists to black conversion. To, um, did that continue? Were the Moravian missionaries able to make headway against that? How did, how did that all play out? Did they continue to have that level? of hostility as the century wore on. Right. Um, I would say that it does eventually get better, but there there is still consistent, there, there's a lot of distrust um, towards missionaries um, in general, um, especially any kind of missionary who's trying to convert an enslaved person. Uh, and actually, I, I didn't, I didn't have um, I, I didn't get to this in the talk, but in my in my book I develop an argument. I say I give it a name, and I call it Protestant supremacy, right? Because I think it is based in this idea that if you allow an enslaved person to become a Christian, then that will threaten, you know, the the claim that that person is a piece of property. And and I think that even once you have the language of whiteness develop so that there's a new racial justification for slavery, that there is still an anxiety that persists for a very long time among a lot of slave owners who just who do not want to see enslaved people, you know, they don't, they don't, I, I mean, I think it's a very basic thing, you know, they don't want to see them as fully formed human people, you know, human beings, and they don't want to, um, you know, sit next to them in church, and even when they do allow them into church, they make them sit in the balcony, etc. So, um, yeah, I do, I, so in terms of the, the actual experience of Moravian missionaries, it's the first decade in St. Thomas is extraordinarily bad. Um, I mean, they really are like getting physically assaulted. Um, they're in prisons. I mean, there's, some of you might know John Sensbach's great book, Rebecca's Revival, which sort of documents that um, a lot of a lot of what happens there, um, and and this is the reason 
that the missionaries do try to sort of, they, they, they then respond by defending slavery, which eventually does get, it, it means that you know, over time they're not physically assaulted to the same extent, but there's still distrust. Thank you. Yes. Uh, emancipation <coughs> took place in 1834. So this is really a relatively short period of time, approximately 100 years. Uh, or a long period of time. Uh, yes, <laughs> I don't know, yeah. depends on your well, perspective. <laughs> but I'm thinking, uh, I don't know if your studies took you to throughout that period of right. slavery. Uh, but uh, how did how were uh, uh, the slaves connected with the Moravians mm -hmm. able to stay with the Moravians mm -hmm. and, and, and cultivate uh, a commitment to the Moravian church after emancipation? You know, that's a, it's a very good question, an important one. It's not one that I look to, but um, there's some great work that's, and Natasha Lightfoot, uh, who I heard has, was here somewhat recently, um, giving a talk, but she has a great book about Antigua um, and looking at the shift from you know, what happens uh, during emancipation and after emancipation. Uh, and then the other, the other research that I would point you to um, for Jamaica, Richard Dunn's uh, new book, Two Plantations, one of them is, is based on the Mesopotamia plantation, which is, was a Moravian owned, and it was, um, and so, and he looks at several generations of uh, enslaved and then free people, m many of whom were uh, members of the Moravian Church. So, um, yeah, I can't speak to it as well as those people can. So, I, I offer instead two two citations for you. Thank you.